Well, we left off in our last class considering this. Considering the idea that the glorified, redeemed, you and me, we hope, we pray, and hopefully we're developing faith that we are actually part of that group. We'll get to spend a year in fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ and with the fellow saints. And when you look at the things that are on this screen here, look at some of the things that are revealed about what we will do during that time. In Luke 22, it indicates that we will actually personally spend time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Or in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, when compared to Luke 20 and verse 36, that we will ascend into the heavens because we will be made equal to the angels and the angels of God behold the face of the Father which is in heaven, even though our mission is here on earth. To be able to ascend, perhaps for a few hours each day, to worship before our God, to enter into the throne room of heaven, to see God face to face. Remember what happens to the pure in, God, in heart? They shall see God, Christ says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18, in verse 8. In Job 19, verse 26 and 27, it also indicates this. We will actually stand in the presence of God himself, even though we acknowledge that by his spirit, he is everywhere present, but he is presented as having a specific throne room and that as he sits on his throne, the Lord Jesus Christ at this time sits at his right hand. Luke 13 verse 28 indicates that we will be spending time with and getting to know our fellow saints from all the ages, from around the world that have ever existed over the last 6,000 years. Zechariah 3 in verse 7 indicates that the angels will still be involved, even though they're not the ones who are actually going to be uh, the ones to whom in the thousand years that they will be ruling over the nations. We will still be involved with them. We will be given places to walk amongst the ange and angelic host. We will meet the angels. We will listen and learn from their experiences. Think about the experiences that they could share with us. They are at least 6,000 years old. Ephesians 3 indicates that, we'll be with that we will be learning and perceiving things that we have no idea that they even exist or things that have ever happened throughout this universe. And those are the things that we get to look forward to. However, there will come a time when that year will be completed and we will at that point strap on our swords, so to speak. Come with me to Psalm 149. Psalm 149, it says this. There's, we're just going to come to the last part of the psalm in verse 5. It says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Now, if this is talking about the saints being joyful in glory, they've been glorified. That's actually another verse. We can add to all our list of things that you will experience in the kingdom. There will be great joy when you are glorified. But what is the context of that joy? Let them sing aloud upon their beds. And even if as saints, although I don't think we'll have to sleep, we may spend some personal time in resting as it were so we can meditate on the things of the word. It says, let them sing aloud upon their beds. They're not sleeping on their beds. They're singing praise to God. Verse 6, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a sharp two-edged sword in their hand. What are they doing with this particular sword? Well, the next verse says, verse 7, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment that is written. This honor have all his saints. Praise ye, Yahweh. And, you know, that passage there may be one that we have difficulty relating to, because I am going to guess that most in this room, at least I hope, are not actually bloodthirsty individuals that want to go out and kill people. And yet, when you read this passage, 
You're reading about individuals who are praising God and joyful in glory, and they love to go and do his bidding, even if it involves picking up a sword and executing vengeance upon the nations and binding them in chains of iron and fetters, all the nobles, the governments, that is, being brought into subjection. And that is actually a little bit of a horrifying thing that we might shrink away from, as it were. That's normal. That's natural. It's probably, to a certain degree, healthy to have that perspective. Except we need to grow beyond that. In order to grow beyond this, to the point where you can look forward to the judgments of God, you need to see life for what it is. You need to see God's righteousness. You need to learn to love God and his ways and to see a far greater plan and purpose. And in contrast to that, you need to see the world and flesh for what it is. There's lots of nice people out there. I I get that. But did you know that there's more human trafficking in the world today than ever before? There's more slavery than there has ever been. Millions of people live in slavery. Human laborers, many of them from North Korea, by the way. That's how the North Korean government makes a lot of its money. And they're actually building those great big uh, buildings in in the UAE, etc. That's all throughout the world. Human trafficking. Think of all the greed and the selfishness. Think of all those churches out there who promote lies from the pulpit so that individuals have believed a lie and had their eyes closed to the things of the truth to never be able to participate in the things that we're talking about because of the lies and the treachery that religion has infiltrated the earth with. I want to get rid of those things. You know, if at the judgment seat, and this is not what's going to happen, but if, if Christ was to extrapolate the devil out of me, you know, the flesh, the old man of the flesh, if he was able to put it in in front of me and give me a sword and say, Nathan, remember that story of when Samuel hewed Agag in pieces? I want you to do that with that bias to sin within you. I would take that sword and I would love to do that. Now, even though that sounds kind of violent, I would love to destroy the source of wickedness. It's not my job, though. That's what Christ did, and it's what he will do for us when we are glorified and actually redeemed. He will remove that problem from us. But all the results of the problem that is all throughout the world, you and I get to go out and deal with. Can you imagine putting an end to suffering? putting an end to deceit and treachery and lies? Can you imagine putting an end to wickedness and sin and all those things that exalt themselves against God? Putting an end to the trafficking. Putting an end to any of those other things that go on in this world. And that's the joy that we have to look forward to. Unfortunately, not everyone is going to want to let go of these things that the world has to offer. And they will have to go with those things. So yes, there will be judgments. And there will be a time in which there will be a slaying of the modern day Canaanite, as it were. But that's something that one day we will participate in this. So now we are kind of switching gears a little bit. And we are getting to a point now where we're not just talking about the personal effect of resurrection, judgment, and the marriage of the Lamb. But now we are beginning to look at the work that we will undertake over the next few years. So let's look at this timeline. And uh, on this timeline, we should be somewhat familiar with this timeline now. After resurrection, judgment, and marriage, there is then going to be the Battle of Armageddon. But as we have depicted on the timeline, there is a gap, a period of time. And what we want to look at is what are the events that lead up to the Battle of Armageddon? Because there's many things that are actually revealed for us. So we're going to start by going to Daniel chapter 2. So let's go to Daniel chapter 2. I think probably many of us are familiar with this story. Remember, 
the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king sees in a dream. And oftentimes we look at that image and, and we picture it as being a picture of, okay, the head of gold represents the Babylonian empire. And then after the Babylonian empire, you have the chest and arms of silver, rep which represents the next empire, which would be the Medo-Persians. And then after the Medo-Persians, we then know that the belly and thighs represent the Greeks. And after the Greeks, the legs of iron represent the Romans and so on and so forth, right? And that's how we typically picture Daniel chapter 2, or at least oftentimes we can. But there's a few things we need to consider, and that is that that's not the primary point of Daniel chapter 2. It's simply to give us a nice prophecy that outlines the different things that would happen amongst the empires of the world. Although it's true that that image does happen to depict those things. What nation would, or what empire would rise and then fall and then be followed by another one? That is true, but it's not the point. The point of that vision is actually to get to the point of what happens when the stone cut out of the mountain without hands smites the image, which, by the way, is the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. So when you read that, read it carefully. We have it on the screen here. It says this, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Well, you know, the Babylonian empire that existed like 2,500 years from now, or, or sorry, uh, in the past. And the Medo-Persians, they were thousands of years ago. Same with the Greeks, same with the Romans. Why is it that this verse is saying that when Christ and the saints when they execute this judgment upon the nations, that is going to grind all of them together. Do you see that there in bold? They are broken to pieces together. Well, it's because actually what that image represents is it represents the kingdom of men. And in the past, it's true. The Babylonian Empire represented the kingdom of men. The Medo-Persian Empire represented the kingdom of men. So did the Greek Empire. So did the Roman Empire. But in the last days, who is the kingdom of men that is being spoken of? Well, what we can do is we can look at this clue here in Daniel chapter 2. And part of that kingdom of men is going to be manifested by the areas that were under the control of each of those four empires. So as we have on the screen here, there's the Babylonian empire, top right hand side. That's the area that it covered. Then the Medo-Persian Empire covered that area around it, all right? So mostly in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Then, as you have depicted on the bottom here, you have the Grecian Empire, the extent that it covered, and then you have the Roman Empire and the extent that it covered. It's a whole swath of area. Basically, throughout the Middle East, from India, all the way through Europe and parts of Northern Africa as well. That is the area that this image represents. And all the nations that are in that area, represented by the ten toes, some are strong and, and some are weak, some are iron, some are clay, those, are, those nations are specifically the nations that are located in this area that those empires in the past had control. So look at Daniel chapter 2 from that perspective as well, not just from a historical perspective. Now, with that in mind, having Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa in our lens now, let's go to Ezekiel 38. So in Ezekiel 38, we have another prophecy here of the nations at the time of the return of Christ, at the time of the latter days. Now, I'm guessing that many of you have listened to lectures at some point on this topic of Daniel chapter 11 and Ezekiel 38 and Zechariah chapter 14 and the return of Christ and all these, these kinds of things. So I want to just skim over the surface and remind us of what is going on in these passages. In Ezekiel 38 and verses 1 to 13, we have this group of nations who is led by Gog, who is of the land of Magog. So just one little thing I'm just going to identify and that is that this Gog would appear to be the chief prince of the Rus, which is the kingdom of the Rus is the area of Meshach. And that's the area of the Russians. He's a chief prince from there. 
He's of the land of Magog, which is currently the area that does include part of the kingdom of the Rus, which is all the way from, from Moscow, which is Moscow is on the western border of Russia, by the way. It's actually not that far from the western border when you look at the whole map of Russia. And Magog also includes in it the actual um, uh, Ukraine and Belarus. So places that are kind of in the news in the last uh, few years since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So it presents this individual, this power, it may be Putin or maybe some successor that comes after him, depending what the next few years reveal and what actually happens. And they build a confederacy of nations. And it just so happens that when we identify these nations that they actually line up with the same basic areas as Daniel chapter two, throughout Europe, the Middle East and Northern Africa. But I want to bring you to verse 7. So in verse 7, it says this. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company. He's speaking, this is a prophecy to go, okay? Thou and all thy company that are assembled with thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now, Jesenia says that that word for guard actually means a prison guard, like a warden. You know what that verse is actually saying? That when Gog of the land of Magog confederates his force together, not everyone is there willingly with them. He is like a prison guard to them. So yes, we are looking for a king of the north that, that involves this area of, uh, of Europe and many of the uh, Middle Eastern nations, many of the Northern African nations. It will involve Russia. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that they're all really close allies. He's brought them together and he is a prison guard to them. So it'll be very interesting to see if anyone follows the news. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see over the next several years as events unfold, what's going to happen. So if I was one of these countries that's bordering Ukraine right now, like if I was in Moldova, for example, they've been directly threatened by, uh, by Russia. They're next on the list after Ukraine. I'm going to look at what's going on in Ukraine and the fact that Russia has just been eating away at Ukraine. And I personally, if I was that country, I would be like, you know what? If they threaten me, I'm just going to go put on my hands. Okay, that's fine. If I need to fly your flag, no problem. Do I need to pay some taxes or just be available to do something for you when you want me to do something? I can do that. Just don't destroy my country and all my people. I'm going to have to swallow my pride. It may be that when Gog confederates all his forces together, that that may be one of the motivations. So you can see how that all these events in Ukraine that drag on and on, and then the whole world is tired of it. And the West is saying, do we really need to continue to support this war? That there's all kinds of directions that this could take. But no matter what the twists and turns are that the, these events take, of which I cannot predict exactly what they are, we do know that these nations that you see in the red here are going to be confederated together. Now, when you come to Daniel chapter 11, it speaks of a similar time period, or sorry, the same time period. Now, in Daniel chapter 11, we're going to read this section from uh, verse 40 through to 45. Now, verse 40 starts and says this, at the time of the end. So we're actually dealing with this, this period of time called the end time, the time of the end. Now, here's a little challenge for you. What is the end time? It's easy to say that's a return of Christ, but can you prove that? Well, if you actually go to chapter 12 and verse 1, it uses the same phrase. There's no chapter breaks in the Bible, by the way. I mean, that's something that one of the cardinals added back in like the, the, the Middle Ages, all right? They added the, cha the, the chapter breaks and the verses and all that kind of stuff. So really, chapter 11, verses 40 to 45, just flow right into chapter, chapter 12. What does chapter 12, verse 1 say? It says this, and at that time, this, that, that means it's the same time as chapter 11, verse 40, the time of the end. What's going to happen at that time? Verse 1. 
Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. That represents the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. A reference to the judgment seat. Verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so when you read verses 2 and 3, or sorry, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, you go, oh, so this time of the end is actually in the context of the resurrection and the judgment. So the last few classes, we've been looking at the resurrection and the judgment, the things that happen amongst the saints. But what is going on in the world during this time? That's where you go back to chapter 11 and in verse 40. So at that time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. What does he come with him with? It's with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Guess what? In Ezekiel chapter 38, Gog of the land of Magog, he comes with a huge army. Just like in Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, where does he go? And he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. By the way, in Ezekiel chapter 38, where does Gog and all his confederacy, where do they end up in? The mountains of Israel, the glorious land. All right, so this is a parallel passage in Daniel chapter 11. Same time period, same events being spoken of as in Ezekiel chapter 38. And what does it tell us here about what's happening? Well, it adds uh, some details. So they enter into the glorious land, verse 41, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. So picture this northern confederacy, and they're sweeping down throughout the Middle East. They've taken Turkey, they've taken Constantinople, and they're sweeping down through the Middle East, down through Israel. They're taking many of these little countries along the way, anyone who has allied themselves with, uh, with Israel, and they've ended up down where? In Egypt. And when you continue reading through this, it says he shall, um, verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So it's almost as if what it's saying is that there's a treasure in Egypt. And the king of the north is saying, I want that treasure. And the ones I'm going to work closest with are the Ethiopians and the Libyans. Where are they? Well, the modern day Ethiopia is actually where the, the ancient Ethiopia was at one point. And that's right here. Okay? Just south of Egypt. In fact, the land of Ethiopia is actually where the source of the Nile comes from. It's the rains that fall in the Ethiopian highlands that actually supply the waters of the River Nile. Imagine if Ethiopia is building dams right now. Imagine if they were to close those dams and not let the water through. Imagine what would happen to Egypt and just hold that thought in your mind. Now that country, Ethiopia, along with Libya, where's Libya? Libya is in Northern Africa. It's just west of Egypt. And there's special mention in Daniel chapter 11 about the Libyans and the Ethiopians that are with this king of the north. Just a little bit more detail added that Ezekiel 38 doesn't quite uh, emphasize as much. Ezekiel 38 gives a bigger picture. This one emphasizes things going on in the land of, uh, in the continent of Africa. But then what happens is after he has successfully gone down into Egypt... Then, verse 44, tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So you get this picture of here's, here's this military force that has come down, they come to Egypt. All right, where is east? Well, east, if you go directly east, is into the land of Arabia. You've also got, in the north, you've got, well, the island of Cyprus, I guess, is directly north. Now, by the way, there's also a king of the south. We haven't spent much time at this point, talking about the king of the south, but that's talking about all these other allied powers like the UK and Canada and India and Australia. Possibly the United States is involved also in that. 
And along with them, we're going to also find, and Ezekiel 38 brings this out, is that you've also got Sheba and Dedan, as well as those ships of Tarshish. And it actually represents these Arabian uh, tribes as well. So the um, Saudi Arabia, for example. And all those are resisting against the king of the north. They're saying, what are you doing coming down and doing this? Can you really come and take a spoil and to take a prey? And yet he does go down and he does this. Now, Cyprus just happens to be a, a base for uh, the U.S. and the U.K. So he hears fighting some of Egypt as he's there in Egypt. Out in the north, probably the area of Cyprus, the ships of Tarshish have signaled in. You can just imagine the aircraft carriers and the battleships all these missile destroyers who are sailing into the Mediterranean. And he's also heard some other tidings from out of the east as well, out in the deserts of Arabia, whatever that might be. Well, we keep reading and what happens, verse 44, but tidings of the east and the north shall trouble him. And with these troublesome tidings, what does he do? Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, to utterly, to make away many. And it says in verse 45, And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. All right, you figure this out for yourself. Where does he go? In verse 45, look at what that verse says. He shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas. So you're looking for two seas. And you're looking for what would be called a glorious holy mountain in the context of Scripture. Well, what we're actually looking at is the seas of the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. There's your two seas. And right between them is, guess what? Jerusalem, the glorious holy mountain. And what this verse is revealing to us is that this king of the north, who eventually sweeps down into Egypt, when he hears his tidings out of the north and out of the east, he goes back and he establishes, and it says, he plants his tabernacles between the seas the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. But it says, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So what seems to be the case is that scriptures are revealing to us that not only will there be this great confederacy of nations, Russia and Europe and various allies, but that actually what this group of nations is going to do is they're going to end up establishing a base in the glorious holy mountain in Jerusalem. Do you see that in verse 45? He shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. And he's planted there. And I can't tell you how long that is going to be for. It will be for a period of time, possibly even for a few years. So remember, when we started back here, we're looking at the suggested timeline of the events that occur when Christ returns. We have the return of Christ with the resurrection, judgment, and marriage of the Lamb. And we're locked away in those chambers. And meanwhile, in the world, great indignation is taking place, Isaiah 26 had told us. And in Daniel chapter 12, it calls it a time of trouble such as, such as never was. So what's happening amongst the nations during that time period leading up to the battle of Armageddon? Well, that's what those passages, Ezekiel 38 and Daniel chapter 11, are helping to reveal to us. There's going to be these various uh, invasions that take place. Now, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up a suggested order of events because I look to myself, I, I think, well, okay, look, if I could kind of put an order to all the events that take place when Christ returns, it would help me to just kind of organize it in my mind. But when I do that, I personally find I have to do it in two different columns. On the one side, we have this column to the right, which is the ordering events that have to do with the multitudinous Christ. So what are they? First thing is, Christ returns to the earth hidden from the nations. We talked about that in class one. We also talked about the resurrection and judgment taking place at Sinai. That's classes one and two. We talked about the marriage of the lamb and, and a period of rejoicing. That was class three. And we've established that those are, that's the order of events amongst the multitudinous Christ. In this class, we want to talk a little bit about how that then, when we strap on the sword of judgment, as it were, and we go with Christ, we will go into Arabia. We will go into Egypt, and then we will appear to the world in Jerusalem, defeating the armies that have gathered to battle, as Daniel chapter 11, verse 45 describes. They've planted the tabernacle of their palace in the glorious holy mountain. So I can kind of look at this, and I can create an order of events for Christ of the saints. 
Now I can also create another second column, which is the order of events that go on in the world. And so, for example, you have Gog confederating his forces, which, by the way, if I had to put a date to that, I would say it started in 2014. And I could be somewhat off. But this whole war in Ukraine, by the way, yeah, sure, the invasion was a couple of years ago, but it's actually been going on since 2014, and Russia actually annexed uh, Crimea. Then there was a war in the Donbass, started in 2015. Do you know that Gog has been confederating his forces for at least 10 years? And we expect that over the next several years, this process will gain momentum and speed up. So that's one of the things we'll see, is that Gog will confederate his forces so that you have these allied nations that Ezekiel 38 describes and that are alluded to in Daniel chapter 2. Then you have Gog taking Turkey and becoming the king of the north. We don't really have time to delve really into that, but that's what Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 is speaking of. He becomes the king of the north when he has finally taken Constantinople in Turkey. Then, at that point, we read in Daniel chapter 11 how that the king of the north sweeps down taking Egypt. We then considered how that the king of the south powers, they assemble north of Egypt. How that the king of the north heads back to Jerusalem. And then how that the war of the nations takes place with Israel and Jerusalem being the central battleground. Now, I realize we did that in like half an hour, and that does not do justice to it. I'm only meaning to skim over the surface, get that picture in your mind. But this is what I will, what the point that I hope we can drive home. How do you consolidate those two lists together? And the thing is, I can't really. I don't know exactly when it is that these different events will take place. For example, how much of the confederating of Gog's forces are we going to see before we are called to judgment? I don't know, actually. I don't know the answer to that. In fact, when the king of the North Power sweeps down taking Egypt, that will probably be long after Christ has returned, or at least after Christ has returned. Probably. But there's a possibility we may even see the king of the North in Egypt, before we're called to judgment. We, we don't know the exact uh, time frame here. But what we do know is that there will come a time based on Isaiah chapter, uh, uh, chapter 19 in which Christ and the saints will go into Egypt. Egypt, a country in which a cruel Lord has been in dominion over it. That cruel Lord is the king of the north. And we know that Isaiah 19 is actually a prophecy of events that have yet to come to pass because it talks about Egypt being converted and worshiping Christ. And so we know that by the time Christ and the saints go into Egypt, so this point here, that one there is going to happen after this one here where the king of the north heads back to Jerusalem. So it might be worth us just considering for a moment that while we look at current events and all the things that are going on in the world today, what we cannot deduce from that is when Christ will actually return to the earth to call us to judgment. It could be at any point in this list. Okay, well, let's look at some of these, uh, some of these different places that we're going to actually go and visit. Um, let's go to the Egypt one first, because in e Egypt, we've, we've just been talking about that in Daniel chapter 11. So let's go to um, Isaiah 19. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes what happens in prophecy is a snapshot, an end snapshot is given first. Here's the big picture. And then what it does is it goes back and, and it fills in the details that lead up to that picture. All right. So in verse 1 of Isaiah 19, it says this. This is the burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord, or Yahweh, rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. Okay, so this passage is saying that God, with the cloud that he's riding on, is going to come into Egypt. Hmm. Has that ever happened in the past? I wonder if this is really a futuristic prophecy. Well, just turn over the page. Actually, you don't eat, well, depending on your Bible, it's, it's right here in, in Isaiah chapter 19. In verse 18, it says this. 
In that day shall five cities of the land of Egypt speak the, la the language of Canaan and swear to Yahweh of hosts. Really? What? This is saying that cities in the land of Egypt, after Yahweh has entered in, are going to swear to Yahweh of hosts? Have the Egyptians ever done that before? Let's keep reading. What does it say here in verse 19? In that day there shall be an altar to Yahweh, not to the God of the Nile, not to false Christianity that is there in Egypt today, but there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to Yahweh. Verse 20, And it shall be a sign and for a witness unto Yahweh of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they, the Egyptians, shall cry unto Yahweh because of the oppressors. That's interesting. We're talking about an e Egypt that is converted to the God of Israel. An Egypt that is, will now worship and build an altar to God, to Yahweh. But they're doing that because they've had an oppressor. And you know what? God's going to listen to that cry of the Egyptians. He's going to send them a savior. You see what this verse says? Keep reading in verse 21. For they shall cry unto Yahweh because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Verse 21. And Yahweh shall be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know Yahweh in that day, and they shall do sacrifice and oblation, yea, they shall vow a vow unto Yahweh and perform it. Can you... Can you see what that is saying? This is saying that Egypt is actually going to be converted. One of the first nations to be converted in the earth is actually going to be Egypt. When you went back to verse 1, who is it that's doing the converting? Well, verse 1 said this. Let's reread it. The burden of Egypt. Behold, Yahweh rideth on a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. Yahweh is representing or represented by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what about that swift cloud that he is riding on? Well, remember in Hebrews, it talks about that great cloud of witnesses. In Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are the great cloud of witnesses? It's the men and women of faith, some of which are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. That's the cloud. So this is Christ and the saints in verse 1, and they're going into Egypt. And they're going to deliver Egypt from a cruel lord and from an oppressor who has been in control. For example, in verse 4, so you have this section from verses 2 through to 15, which shows the state that Egypt has fallen into under the oppressors. Verse 4 says this, And the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord and a Fierce king shall rule over them, saith Yahweh, saith the Lord, Yahweh of hosts. Okay, so what that's saying is that Egypt is going to have a cruel lord, also called a fierce king, who is going to invade the land. If I was doing Bible marking right now with a pencil in my Bible, I would put Daniel chapter 11, verse 42 to 45, right beside verse 4. In Daniel chapter 11, just a little bit earlier on, it talks about a, a fierce king. It's revealed as being the king of the north in those verses, verses 41 through to 44, 45, who is being described here in Isaiah as being a cruel lord and that fierce king who has dominion over Egypt. So it's kind of interesting to think that one of the first jobs of judgment that we will have is actually to sneak in behind the scenes. If I was just to go back to this, uh, this screen here. When the, the king of the north heads back to Jerusalem because of these tidings of the east and out of the north, we then sneak in behind him, Christ of the saints come into Egypt, and we convert Egypt. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, is, is that's one of the missions that we will be sent on. Now, it was also true that in Daniel chapter 11, it said that there's also tidings out of the east. Now, the tidings out of the north, I'm going to guess, and this is just a suggestion, the tidings out of the north, as I've already suggested, is probably the Tarshish powers who have sent all their aircraft carriers and battleships into the Mediterranean Sea. All right? But who's this tidings out of the east? Well, let's go to Habakkuk chapter 3. 
Because meanwhile, as the king of the north has been coming down into Egypt, Christ and the saints have been busy at work amongst the nations. Now in Habakkuk chapter 3, we have uh, this prophecy. Um, the whole chapter would be worth going through the entire thing, but let's just you know, let's skim through it and get the overall picture. Now, in verse 3, we've already briefly kind of looked at this one. It says this, God came from Teman. Now, the word for God there is Eloah. So it actually means a, a mighty one came from Teman. Okay, so that's speaking of Christ. Teman is the land to the south of Israel. So this is now Christ and the saints, and they have left the chambers of judgment, that year of rejoicing of Christ and the saints together is now done. So they come from the south, and where did they go? The Holy One came from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Now, at the, that's the ultimate goal that is being led for, is that the earth will become full of the praise of God. And this is when we begin to start to be manifested to some of the nations. Verse 4, his brightness was as the light, and he had horns or beams coming out of his hand, and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. So we got some fairly, you know, this prophetic language is full of symbol and metaphor. But at the end of the day, he's got burning coals and pestilence. Kind of sounds to me like he's going to be using judgments, is what this is saying. Verse 6, And he stood and measured the earth, and he beheld... And he drove asunder the nations. This is Christ and the saints. They've left now and they've marched through the land and they're now beginning to drive asunder the nations. The everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills to bow. His ways are everlasting. Now, if you keep your place here and you just reference back down to verse 12, what does it say? Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Which land do you think that is? Well, Habakkuk, an Israeli prophet. I think he's talking about the land of Israel. Verse 12, Thou didst march through the land in indignation and is fresh the heathen in anger. And we have this great threshing judgment that takes place in the land. That's the battle of Armageddon. So if we have the battle of Armageddon happening by the time you get to verse 12, what happens just before the battle of Armageddon? Verse 7. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. All right, so where is Midian? Well, on the screen I have this picture here. here here's Arabia, all right? There's Egypt. Where's Israel? Just up there. And this would be the land of Midian. And the tents of Cushan, although we, we kind of, we might de debate who exactly they were, they were probably actually an, uh, an, an ancient um, name, as it were, that is derived from one of the descendants of Abraham through Keturah. And those descendants happened to actually end up inhabiting this region in the northern part of Arabia. Now that being the case, this area here in verse 7, the tents of Cushan and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. It almost seems to hint in Habakkuk chapter 3 that before the battle of Armageddon takes place where Christ is manifested in Jerusalem to thresh the nations at the battle of Armageddon, that he's already been to the area that is east of Egypt, to the area in the land of Midian, into the area of Saudi Arabia. Now, why is it that you think that you might think that Christ might have a special mission for us to go on into Arabia? Well, in Isaiah 21, it talks about the inhabitants of the land of Tema in a futuristic prophecy. And what does it say that these people of Tema in the land of the south are going to do? It says this, they're going to bring water to him that was thirsty and to actually give bread to those who flee. So you think, okay, so at the time of the end, there's going to be people who are thirsty and who are fleeing. It kind of reminds me, that language reminds me of refugees. 
Well, just think, what's going to happen when the king of the north initially comes down and sweeps down from the north through the promised land and down into Egypt? You're going to have various Jews who are fleeing from the path of destruction, as it were. Where are they going to go? Well, they can't go north because then they're heading into, in, into the jaws of the enemy, so to speak. They can't go west because, well, that's the Mediterranean Sea. They could go south and maybe east a little bit, although a lot of that is desert. And that basically brings them into the area of the Arabians, the land of Teman. And there's a special little prophecy here in Isaiah 21 that indicates that the individuals of the land of Teman will actually be receptive to receiving these Jewish refugees and giving them bread and water. So it may be that Christ goes through into the land of the tents of, of Kushan, into the land of Midian, and we actually have a job to work and to convert those nations there. So it would appear that we have a couple of places to go before we go back there, before we go to Jerusalem and before the Battle of Armageddon in Egypt and in Arabia. All right, with those suggestions in place, I want to take you to Isaiah 34. Actually, we're just going to, for time's sake, read this. By the way, what time am I going to for this one? Five. Five, yeah. So for time's sake, we'll just look at this on the screen. Isaiah 34 verses uh, 1 to 5 talks about a time when the indignation of Yahweh will be upon all nations and his fury will be upon all their armies. And then in Zechariah chapter 12 verse 2, it says this, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 1145, where did the king of the north go and plant the tabernacles of his palace? In the glorious holy mountain, which would thus be between the seas, which would thus be Jerusalem. Zechariah chapter 12, a parallel passage to this time, is saying that Jerusalem will be a cup of trembling to all the people round about when they shall be in the siege against Judah and against Jerusalem. We're looking for, unfortunately, there will actually be another world war when all nations will be surrounding Jerusalem. And in Zechariah chapter 14, from which our initial reading was taken from, it actually says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. What do you think it's going to be like for the Jews at that time? Here's four passages. Zechariah 13 verse 8 says this, And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith Yahweh, this is a prophecy in the context of the land of Israel. In all that land, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. There's something like 7 million Jews currently in the land today. Two-thirds of that is roughly 5 million. The scriptures prophesy that two-thirds of them are going to die. That's the second holocaust that is being prophesied of. Zechariah 14, verse 2 says this, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. It will fall. The houses will be rifled, the woman ravished, and half the city will go forth into captivity. That means hundreds of thousands will go forth into captivity. You remember what happened in October 7th of last year when Hamas came down? You know, and they killed, I, I forget what it was, 1,200 or 1,400 people. And they took another 234 people or something like that as hostages. This is prophesying of a time when half the city, at least the Jewish population of the city, will go forth into captivity and will be taken hostage, as it were. In Joel chapter 3, verse 3, it describes the conditions that will be upon these individuals. For they have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine. And they traffic those individuals. In Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 23, it says this about that. And the heathen shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they trespassed against me. They are a witness to the nations. However, what's interesting is that it's not just left at that with the destruction of Israel. It is the rebuilding of Israel that we look to, to, that there is actually a hope for the Jewish people. 
So Zechariah 14 verse 3 goes on to say that then at that point, when all seems to be lost, when the half of the city that remains is hiding in the rubble of this destroyed city, then shall Yahweh go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem. Now, his feet standing on the Mount of Olives. Didn't we just consider that in some of our earlier classes? In Acts chapter 1. Remember when Christ and the disciples, just before his ascension, they're talking about the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. And then Christ is taken up into heaven and the angels appear to the disciples and say, This Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. And yes, his feet left the Mount of Olives almost 2,000 years ago, as Acts chapter 1 describes. But Zechariah 14 describes how his feet will come back on the Mount of Olives. Now, when he comes down and he splits the Mount of Olives in two, and I don't know exactly the details of how that battle will take place. With go getting into imagining gory details, suffice it to say that the nations who have assembled themselves against Israel, against Jerusalem, against the Jewish people, will be crushed and annihilated and destroyed. You can just picture, though, that what the nations will be thinking. They have seen this being come down from heaven. You know, nowadays on the news, there's things about like, what are these UFOs flying around and stuff? There's all this like, you know, people are all full of, full of, you know, is this like some new military invention? I wonder what the nations would think when this individual, this thing comes down from heaven, it touches the mountain and all of a sudden the mountain splits apart. Imagine the theories that will be made regarding that. But for those who are actually in that area, like the Jews that are still there in Jerusalem, they'll crawl out from under the rubble. And they will look and they'll see, this is a man. Zechariah 13 verse 6 says this, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? It's almost as if they come out of the rubble and they come close enough to him to actually, to actually see him. And they can see his face. They can see his body. They can see his hands. They say, wait a second. What are these wounds in your hands? And he responds to them and he says, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 goes on to say how that these Jews, they shall look upon him whom they pierce and they shall mourn for him. They'll finally realize this is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. This is the Messiah, the Christ, that was here 2,000 years ago. And he has returned to the earth. This is the conversion of the Jewish people by the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. They've been destroyed, Ezekiel 39 says, because of the iniquity of Israel. But through these judgments, they have been purged and then converted by the Lord Jesus Christ so that God's law will actually be in their hearts. We know there will be a great earthquake. Zechariah chapter 14 describes it. I just want to make this brief little point to you. Uh, did you know that every 80 to 100 years, a major quake occurs along the Dead Sea Fault? Now, we're looking north in this picture. Here's Israel. Barbara's right, we're looking south. We're going to be from the north, we're looking south. And there's this great rift. You kind of see it, most from the Dead Sea, all the way up there. And that is actually um, a fault line. And that fault line is actually an active fault line. It's one of these ones that's actually spreading apart. There's only two fault lines in the world that are like that. The San Andreas fault line on the west coast of North America. That's the only other fault line that's like this one in the, in the Rift Valley. It's a spreading fault line. All the other ones are, are either rubbing ones or they're um, you know, colliding fault lines. And every 80 to 100 years, a major quake occurs along that Dead Sea Fault. By the way, the last one was in 1927. We're due for another big one in this area. And what the Bible prophesies is that at some point, I don't know when, 
But at some point, there's going to be an earthquake so great that the whole mountain of olives will be split in two. Just imagine the effect that this might have around the world, especially when you consider the fact that in Zechariah 14 and verse 10, we read in our reading how that it says that all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rinnan, which is south of Jerusalem. And it, Jerusalem, shall be lifted up. So I've got depicted on the screen where here's this area, and because I'm yellow in the yellow area, that area, which is, by the way, this is all the hill country of Judea. Oh, they're mountains. They're hundreds and hundreds of feet higher than this rift out. So what this verse is saying that that whole mountain range is going to be leveled, and the only chunk of mountain that's going to be left is that area by Jerusalem. So that the area of Jerusalem will be exalted above the surrounding area. That big of an earthquake may very well trigger earthquakes around the world. And not only will the nations have been, dis their armies been destroyed at Jerusalem, the nations that have come to fight against Israel, but it will have a crippling effect on all the nations of the world. And so what we have been looking at here is the march of the rainbow angel. I'm sorry that we can't really get into all those details in any real depth in one hour, but hopefully we've got a bit of a picture of some of the events that might take place leading up to the Battle of Armageddon.